One of the things that you should be thinking about in the back of your mind, I mean, Joe nicely illuminated this issue, is that in geothermal resources, we're looking at transient processes. It's what captivates us as both scientists and engineers. And we're looking at transients that have different length scales and different time scales. And those are the big challenges for us, is how do we predict those, and also the feedbacks because there'll be both negative and positive feedbacks. So that's what is lurking in the back of our mind. And as geoscientists, of course, we go out and survey parameters to try and characterize uh, the way it is right now in terms of, say, the resource. But then, of course, we also need the numerical modeling, which helps forecast how things will change through time. And throughout this conference, you're going to see those issues rise over and over and over again. So in this presentation, we're just going to be talking about fluid chemistry. Of course, geology is the marriage of geology and chemistry. In New Zealand, where I learned most of my geothermal uh, geoscience, the field of geothermal geochemistry was born by chemists coming to New Zealand or being trained in New Zealand and then applying their techniques to geology. Of course, in North America, a lot of geochemistry is actually taught within the geoscience department. So we've had the benefit over the last five decades of hard chemists and, and geoscientists actually coming together and bringing their backgrounds to solving this set of problems. And I have to admit that much of the stuff that we know is decades old. So, we're looking at, uh, we want to assess processes affecting fluid compositions in order to determine reservoir conditions and changes with time. We sample and analyze the thermal waters. We have springs and wells from which we can get fluids, we classify the water types, determine their distribution, so there's some characterization. We apply and interpret geothermometers. Fluid chemistry gives us some sense of temperature, and it, not only at a particular point, but also if we can get particular samples distributed in space, we can pick up, we can build up a picture of, of thermal structure. We can also assess hydrological or physical effects of boiling and mixing. There are other uh, aspects of temperature and fluid composition and pH that are going to be important at, at fine scale or more advanced scale processes or problems, particularly things that deal with scaling and corrosion. You don't want to wreck your $5 million well uh, with mineral deposits or uh, destruction of casing. The geochemist is not only there at the start with exploration, but they're there during development and they're there during production, monitoring the reservoir for for changes with time. And then there's also an environmental aspect, but I'm not going to talk anything about that today. So just go back and remember that all the geothermal geoscientists keep in mind that they're dealing with both physical and chemical processes. Front and center is this heat mass transfer issue. Rick's going to talk about how temperature and pressure gradients relate to permeability and velocity and hydrology and fluid flow. The chemistry is a reflection of these physical processes. We also have fluid mineral equilibria. It's the heart and soul of, of our geothermal, uh, our, the chemical geothermometers. We also have to mitigate or manage corrosion and deposition. And Joe's made reference to the hydrothermal alteration, which has different length scales of value, both in exploration and reservoir development. The great strides made in chemical analyses over the last 20 years means that just about the whole periodic table is available for analysis at a cost-effective uh, sort of basis. But so far, we really are restricted to a few components. And for those of you who are not chemists, you'll still think this is a bewildering list of constituents. Those nodding their head, it's always nice to know that there's some Greek that still requires interpretation and facilitation by other geoscientists. 
So really what I want to try and give you a background is that there is a pathway, there's a, there's a, there's a framework for interpretation that allows for even non-geoscientists to see how signal is extracted. So we analyze waters, we analyze gases, there are isotopes that are analyzed too. The biggest thing to overcome are the units. So waters are typically analyzed in milligrams per kilogram or parts per million. If you want to make, if a geochemist wants to make their work unreadable to a, other geoscientists, they'll use millimoles and moles. Gases, unfortunately, are got this array of different units. This just takes time to work through. Stable isotopes have their own notation. We're not going to get into the isotopic notation at all here. Back to the waters, we have anions and cations. These have long been analyzed and characterized. We also have species that are neutral in a, in a, in a simplistic sense that is, they have no charge, but these are effectively weak acids. And the notation here, silica SiO2, is actually the shorthand for silicic acid, which is H4SiO4. And boron is, a, is the shorthand for boric acid. And CO2 is the shorthand for carbonic acid. Even arsenic is, is, is occurring as a, as a weak acid in deep geothermal waters. The gases that we analyze, mainly carbon dioxide and H2S. There are other ones, ammonia, helium, hydrogen, argon, nitrogen, methane, and oxygen. Oxygen is measured for the simple reason that you're trying to back out any atmospheric contamination during sampling. Geothermal waters won't have any oxygen in them. Highly reduced. In the high temperature systems that Joe was making reference to, and if we have volcanic gas input, it will be detected in your geothermal reservoir because, although I said there's no oxygen in geothermal waters, there are oxidized species such as SO2. And there are these strong acids, HCl and HF. Of course, at the hot temperatures of the magmatic intrusion, they're not acids, but as they cool, will dissociate and become very reactive. The key isotopes that we have to analyze mainly are oxygen and hydrogen. These are not just for academic uh, study. These are very powerful in terms of understanding how fluids are moving through a rock mass, not only over geological time, but also under uh, production time. And it's a very important uh, tool and mapping out mixing and boiling effects. Uh, tritium and helium have strong exploration value. Helium isotopes, well, tritium uh, can give us the age of the water. It's either going to be less than 60 years old or older than 60 years old, so we need to know if we're dealing with young or old waters. And helium isotopes tell us that there's a magmatic heat source. Might not seem so useful in. Uh, Volcanic terrains, where you can see lots of volcanoes around you, but there are a number of places for geothermal resources that have igneous heat sources, have no or little expression at the surface of that magmatic heat. And helium isotopes it is a way of detecting the existence of that magmatic heat source. So all of these have applications. And we're going to talk about tracers, and we're going to talk about indicators. So indicators are basically constituents that give us some clue about reservoir temperature in the form of an equilibration temperature. It's an interpretation. So about halfway through the talk, I'm going to get into those indicators. The tracers are things that tell us where components are coming from or how fluids are moving through the rock mass. And we'll make reference just specifically to chloride in this uh, presentation. 
There are other aspects which need to be managed in terms of scaling and corrosion potential. So silica and calcite are the big issues for, for scaling. So those constituents relevant to predicting uh, saturation uh, are analyzed. And then there's a range of environmental sensitive uh, constituents as well. So this is what a geochemist tries to interpret, this hydrology. In an exploration context, we may have distribution of hot springs and other thermal features. And what the, what the geochemist, in conjunction with the geologist and the geophysicist, is trying to distinguish this upflow zone from an outflow zone. You want your first well to be drilled here. A point to be emphasized, this fluid, as it migrates through the surface, changes its composition. And that composition at the surface is a reflection of this flow history. So we can actually make some pretty good guesses that help us distinguish this upflow zone from the outflow zone. Another point, and really this is in the high temperature systems, is that the shallow hydrology, top 500 meters, can be incredibly complex. So once we drill wells and get down into the reservoir, we'll see greater homogeneity in terms of uh, water chemistry and heat distribution. I made reference to this already. We have a diversity of environments that we're interested in terms of geothermal resources. We'll come back to this later on. But obviously, the, the goal of the, of the conference is the sedimentary basin environment. I'm going to be talking about experience coming out of the volcanic uh, and uh, intrusion-related uh, geothermal environment. But it all has application because we're looking at a set of processes that help us understand the nature of this reservoir. They can be applied to the extensional fault and, and the sedimentary basin environment, too. If you look on the planet at uh, the compositions of waters, that you can analyze, you see great diversity. Geothermal systems are completely blind to that diversity. In other words, the convective heat transfer doesn't care what the composition of the fluid is. It'll take whatever working fluid that's available that will move through a rock mass. So it can be a very saline water, say something that's dissolved evaporites, such as this oil field brine or the salt and sea, where you get very high salinities. Or it can be a very dilute water, which you see over here at Wairaki. So only uh, 2,000 ppm chloride, very dilute. You would barely be able to taste that. Seawater salinity for reference is about 20,000 ppm. So incredible diversity in terms of what's available for fluid circulation. And I suppose what we need to appreciate is that within the geothermal system, within this plume, we know that buoyancy is going to be an important force driving that fluid upwards. But within the plume structure, there's going to be a distribution of porosity and permeability that dictates residence times for fluid. And that's going to influence water-rock interaction and certainly have a huge impact on the composition of waters. So our indicators are influenced for this a high proportion of minerals and just small pore space so the water is interacting with the minerals for long periods of time and that contrasts with this fluid dominated environment where you have an open channel way and fluid movement can be relatively fast and disequilibrium is the nature of the chemical environment. In other words, physical processes will dominate in terms of influencing that water uh, chemistry. So we think about a framework of effects that we can see in water chemistry that relate from origin through to understanding fluid mineral equilibria, water rock interaction, and the physical processes, which in a high temperature environment includes boiling. If it's uh, sub-boiling, then we'll only have to worry about mixing. We can put those processes into a depth level framework. Again, going back to our high temperature system, at deep level, near the base of the convection cell, 
New York water or whatever the recharge water is coming into the hydrothermal system, that will interact with the magmatic components coming off the igneous heat source. Of course, if there is no igneous heat source, then, then that's not an issue. As we get up to the intermediate depth level, water-rock interaction dominates and, and, and transforms fluid compositions that are affected by processes in this field. So water-rock interaction dominates over intermediate depth levels. And then when we come to the shallow levels, mixing and boiling takes over. Most high temperature geothermal resources are at this transition between where water rock interaction and mixing and boiling dominate. And it's for this reason that chemical geothermometers are pretty effective at resource characterization in terms of temperature. So we recognize different water compositions are easily subdivided on the basis of anion constituents as chloride, sulfate, and bicarbonate. We can see these distinctions just in high temperature geothermal systems. In a single high temperature geothermal system, and Joe's already made reference to this. Without going into a lot of detail, you can see the distinctions of, and the concentrations here between chloride waters, sulfate waters, and bicarbonate waters. So there is a quantitative aspect that helps us Define in a lot of detail just exactly the makeup of these different water types. And these are end member examples. And we use simple graphical plots. You'll see hydrogeochemists using something like a Piper diagram or other more sophisticated plots. But I would say, you know, in terms of communicating to a broader geoscientific group, you can just use simple uh, trilinear plots, as Werner Gigenbach always used to argue. It's a simple graphical technique. It helps you distinguish water types. Of course, you don't get concentration. You got three degrees or three parameters that you're, you're showing in two dimensions. But you can see, show relative concentration that helps you distinguish water types. You can interpret chemical structure if you know where the sample points are. And you can even assess in a preliminary way the fluid flow because mixing trends always appear as linear rates of data. The waters have a different visual appearance, and they have a different context. So as Joe pointed out, examples of chloride waters, beautiful transparent springs. You can see to the bottoms of the pools, beautiful examples in, in Yellowstone, and also in New Zealand, Iceland, many volcanic belts around the world. Deposits of silica center. This hot water is saturated in silica, so as it cools, it's depositing this, uh, this, uh, this mass of, of silica. By contrast, the acid sulfate waters, which are very superficial water, they're not part of the reservoir, uh, are corrosive to rock. They dissolve rock. And so most of the mud that you see here is a, is a, is a direct product of water-rock interaction and, and rock dissolution in just the top few meters to tens of meters of the geothermal system. You can drill below these zones. At 100 meters depth, we'll see chloride water. And then on the periphery of systems, bicarbonate water uh, can also develop. This is a peripheral well at Rodham's of Hockey, a fairly unremarkable discharge. You've got foaming water just dribbling over the lip of this pipe. But this well goes down to 1,000 meters depth. And this bicarbonate water is a, is, a, is a peripheral water that was only mapped out by subsurface exploration. Two decades later, it was found to be causing casing corrosion at Broadlands, Ohio. Although a relatively benign water in terms of what we think of in terms of reactivity, for mild steel, this fluid is incredibly corrosive. And if the cementing job is inadequate, then corrosion can ensue, and these hot waters can percolate through the shallow parts of the well. So that well, BR6, was located out over here, now in the pine plantation. Well, this photograph was taken in the 1990s, so this, these pines are gone now. But uh, you can see the, the well field, ore field for 
the eastern half of Northern Zohaki, the western half. The only surface expression of this geothermal system is the Ohaki pool. So just by studying the Ohaki pool, you could have gotten some clues, the water here, about the subsurface reservoir temperature, and even the existence of those bicarbonate waters. But of course, we know that in hindsight, not in a predictive, we didn't know that in the 1960s in a predictive framework. So the yellow in this slide represents the chloride water. You can see this is the reservoir for the Broadlands Ohaki geothermal system. Volcanic rocks overlying uh, basement Greywacky rocks. Two main upflow zones. Yellow represents the distribution of chloride water, and green represents the distribution of bicarbonate water. So just appreciate that the bicarbonate waters are draping over uh, the upflow zone and the chloride water. So different water types can coexist in, in, in the same system. And topography has a lot to do with the control of the distribution of these water types. You go to the Philippines or Indonesia, you'll see this distribution change. Stable isotopes are very useful for not only telling us the sources of water, but they tell us something about water-rock interaction, and they also tell us about boiling and mixing. We don't have enough time to go into the details of how we can use this in a hydrogeochemical uh, environment, but just keep in mind that I know the, 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 the symbols used here, the notation is a little abstract. We're looking at parts per hundred differences in a deuterium hydrogen isotope ratio and an O16, O18 ratio. What you really need to know is that these numbers on the y and x axes relate to a, a provenance of meteoric water, which always plots on a straight line, volcanic or magmatic water, which has a limited field way over to the right side, and the geothermal waters are always near that meteoric water line, but just to the right, and that reflects the deep circulation and hot, high temperature water rock interaction. There's also helium isotopes. I made reference to this. Volcanic arcs show evidence of mantle helium. That mantle helium has a value of about eight to nine times the atmospheric value. Ra is the atmospheric ratio. R is the sample. So atmosphere has a value of one. The upper mantle, eight to nine. Most arc volcanoes have uh, helium isotopes that are greater than one, all the way up to nine, commonly six. And by contrast, radiogenic crust has a very low helium 3 4 ratio because of alpha, uh, well, uh, decay of uranium and thorium, which builds up alpha, alpha particles, which is basically helium 4. So, this is a method commonly used in geothermal exploration for detecting whether or not the geothermal resource has a potential magmatic heat source. Okay, I'm going to skip through this. this. You can read this at your own leisure, but there is a protocol for sampling. We can sample hot springs and wells. Keep in mind that wells commonly are two phase, so we need to have some equipment which takes a two phase fluid and we get, using a, 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 a mini separator, we can isolate a, a gas or a steam <coughs> line from a water line. The gas is measured in special flasks that are evacuated that uh, are prepared so we can analyze for the gaseous constituents. And the, uh, the water samples are run through a condensing coil because even when they come through this, this separator, they're still under pressure and vapor saturated. So when they get to atmospheric condition, they, they themselves are two phase. So you have to run them through that condensing coil. So I want to move on to, to chemical geothermometers. This is an a, a area or a, a, a concept that's been around for 50 years. It was advanced simultaneously in New Zealand, the US, uh, Iceland, uh, Japan, Italy, with the aim of trying to understand fluid chemistry and, and relating it back to uh, the reservoir condition. And as a result, 
there have been a number of chemical geothermometers that have been explored and uh, published about. I'm going to just go through a few simple ones, ones that are still the most useful in a generic context. They all have this similar, very simple algebraic expression. You'll see that T degrees Celsius is on one side, and that we can take aqueous or gaseous parameters and insert them into the equation. They are reformulations of fluid mineral equilibrium, so that we can calculate an equilibration temperature. Equilibration temperatures are interpretations. They are not measured parameters. Don't make the mistake of averaging a bunch of equilibration temperatures and reporting the standard deviation on them. That's completely flawed logic. They, the expressions are simple, and they just require the input of concentrations from the water analyses. Hopefully, then you can just put them right in. Easy to apply, difficult to interpret. Well, let's say challenging to interpret, especially if you're an investor and you're expecting reliability in somebody's interpretation. So here are some examples of chemical geothermometers that, these, that I commonly use. These are the ones that I would say are the best first uh, choice for a broad range of applications. Really quick, excuse me. These are equilibrium, so there's no chemical kinetics involved. That's exactly right. Okay. But the success of these fully depends on kinetics operating and impeding a readjustment of fluid mineral equilibria as the fluids move into the surface. So I'll just touch on that again. So give in a couple slides. And that's, that's another important point. So you'll notice all of these equations have a very similar structure. Concentrations of silica in milligrams per kilogram in these two equations. One is simply dealing with water that comes to the surface without any steam loss. Another one deals with the maximum amount of steam loss if we're under closed system adiabatic heat transfer. I'm sorry I don't have time to go into all the details of that, but just take it that this is a good one if you think you're in a boiling geothermal system. Sodium potassium ratios can also be used. Fournier and Gegenbach both developed geothermometers. Every person in this room could write their own expression that would be slightly different. You don't put your name to it. I don't think you'd get it published. Well, maybe there's some someplace you could, but. Uh, Fournier and Gegenbach provide extremes, but at 250 to 300 degrees, they're basically indistinguishable. And there's this other one of potassium, magnesium, and geothermal. All of these have a thermodynamic framework, so none of them are empirical. So they've got hard chemistry that underpins them. And these, this is the, 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 the the assumptions that Bob Fournier outlined that really are the guides for application of these, these, these tools. You assume that they're based on fluid mineral reaction, that there's an equilibrium condition that's controlled by temperature in the reservoir, and although not strictly required in a true thermodynamic sense, it certainly helps to have an adequate amount of mineral to control the equilibrium. You just have to remember that when ice cubes are melting in a, in a beverage, that only until the last ice disappears does the water temperature start rising above zero degrees C. So that same concept underpins our thermodynamic equilibrium, chemical equilibrium, but the reality is the more minerals there are available, the more they're going to influence these compositions because heterogeneities are commonplace. Okay. Frank, here's, here's the point that needs to be emphasized. 
Once this condition of equilibrium is established at some place, at some depth in the subsurface, this fluid escapes into an open fracture, rise quickly, and in, over the path length at the time required for that fluid to get to the surface, it doesn't equilibrate. In other words, equilibration is only happening at a certain depth, and above that depth, there is no equilibration, so that the composition is freezing in a, a subsurface condition. So you require these rapidly rising waters. And the best way to calibrate these geochemical geothermometers is in a production well. All right, that's where you've got maximum control. You're isolating the, the fluid coming from the reservoir to the surface, and there's going to be no dilution. And at least in high temperature reservoirs, well, uh, the fluid velocities near the surface are, are, are close to solid. So they, they move quickly. We also have to worry about uh, uh, steam loss, mixing, or dilution. We have to take for granted the first three assumptions, and they're, they're probably pretty reliable. They're based on common <coughs> minerals that are occurring in volcanic and sedimentary rocks. The biggest problem comes with the last two assumptions, and that's where experience and skill is required. Generally, we apply chemical geothermometers to deeply circulated waters. So in high temperature geothermal systems, that's the near neutral pH alkali chloride water. In sedimentary basins, we're going to have to make some adjustments for that to be more inclusive of bicarbonate waters. Acid sulfate waters are a no-go zone. They simply are not captured in the assumptions of fluid mineral equilibrium. Acid waters dissolve rock. They don't equilibrate with rocks. Also, where you have exotic waters such as seawater, you may have some issues to deal with. So coming back to this environment, equilibrium is established in this rock-dominated environment. Yeah. Excuse me, what about non-condensable gases? Are those principally in your acid uh, set of fluids? Or are no, no, they're coming up with the neutral pH fluids. Yeah. No. So, yeah. So, because if you're trying to sample, it's virtually impossible to get hydrogen sulfide to stay in any sample that you're likely to take out of the field. Okay, so first I'll just repeat the question. The question was what about non condensable gases? So, non condensable gases in high temperature geothermal systems are largely magmatic in origin, they include water. CO2, H2S. So coming right to your point. Those gases become absorbed and they can effectively are incorporated into the liquid phase for much of this plume uh, pathway. And it's only in the top one to two kilometers where that boiling point for depth curve is intersected that steam fractionates those dissolved gases back into the gas phase and they can rise to the surface along a pathway that's separate from the liquid. In a geothermal well, you're capturing those dissolved gases. And you can sample them. And so there's specialized techniques for, for capturing all of that. So we think we're pretty comfortable in knowing what the deep, we know what the pre-boiled H2S CO2 concentrations are down here. Would it be possible to go to the previous slide? Yeah. OK, I might not be interpreting the uh, third paragraph, but um, the second sentence of the third paragraph. Now, if you're seeing acid sulfate waters coming from the side of a, a volcano, uh, my assumption was that that was indicating that it was hotter, hotter water, I mean, more that, that it was better than chloride water. Okay? Now, is this is this so? From a, in so other words, it, it was a, it was indicating that the source was hotter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, what what is that? Okay. Second sentence. Okay, so there's two things here. So the question was, what's what do acid sulfate waters mean in an exploration context, and how do we relate them to chemical geothermometer? In the broad context, and this is what Joe said, acid sulfate waters are forming where you're getting uh, phase separation in the geothermal system. So they indicate hot temperatures. They indicate boiling conditions. However. <coughs> While they indicate that high heat transfer and the anomalous heat at shallow depths, the water compositions themselves 
are useless for application of chemical geothermometry. So don't apply them because most of the chemical, most of the composition is actually a near surface uh, effect, a near surface process, because these acid sulfate waters are simply dissolving rock. There's actually, there's a couple things. One is that there's no equilibrium established, and two, the chemistry is reflecting just the composition of the rock that's just been dissolved. Sometimes they might be accurate geothermometers, but they might not. It just depends on the rock. No, no never. As, you know, in a short course like this, right. there's going to be exceptions to everything. But as far as we, you know, I know of nobody who tries to interpret acid waters in terms of chemical geothermometry. Right. And I would say, as an investor, be very wary of that. I apologize. No, that's all right. No, no. Well, so we we understand the diversity of this audience. That's a point point of this short course. So if, if this if there's details that we can't cover, by all means, come up and ask Rick or Joe or myself anything about details. And, uh, we know that we're just skimming the, the tops here. So this chemical geothermometer works because we've got this environment where equilibrium is established and then an environment where the fluid movement is so fast that as long as it doesn't undergo any extreme dilution or boiling effects that uh, the composition such as the silica concentration of the sodium potassium ratio actually reflects this condition. So the equilibration temperature is giving you a, a, an indication of the of of the temperature in this in this environment. Okay, so I'm going to go through just a couple of these. Um, I've given you a number of text slides about each of the geothermometers for reference. Uh, you can read them. I'm, I'm not going to go through all of them in, in detail, so I'm going to skip through some of them later on. But we'll we'll, we'll start off and look at this one geothermometer in a little bit of detail. So this is the quartz silica geothermometer. So functionally, all we require is the silica concentration from analysis in uh, gravimetric units, milligrams per kilogram. If they're milligrams per liter, just you can use that too. Density is not a big deal unless it's a salt and sea. And then even then, it would only be a, a, a little bit out. Input it into the formula here compute the temperature, and you will have an equilibration temperature. It's based on this simple expression here, where SiO2 represents quartz as a solid phase, and it's simply dissolving in water to form silicic acid. <coughs> silicic acid is stable over pH range of neutral to acid conditions, so it's pretty relevant to all of uh, geothermal fluid compositions. Lots of experiments in theory to back it up, and uh, quartz is also common in the hydrothermally altered rocks, also in sedimentary igneous and metamorphic rocks. So really, it's a, it's, a, it's a chemical geothermometer that should be effective you know, in a diversity of environments. Once a solution reaches quartz saturation, and it's subject to cooling, that condition of re-equilibration is slow. In other words, the reaction kinetics going back to the left to precipitate quartz are slow enough so that when the water gets to the surface, very little, if any, silica is precipitated. We never see quartz scales in most production wells. Joe, have you seen a quartz scale? No. So we don't see quartz scales in production wells. That's reflecting these reaction kinetics. So that's really good news for us. Because we're dealing with just the concentration of silica, steam loss can be important as can be mixing or dilution. So they can be significant. In a geothermal well, we only have to deal with steam loss, and we can compensate for that. In, in a hot spring, Mixing and dilution are important, and then also there's other complications because silica will precipitate to form the center. 
typically this geothermometer is used in a sub-boiling geothermal setting, so low enthalpy geothermal systems. So that simple algebraic expression was a reformulation of this quartz solubility curve. And where you have linear units here, it's a curve, but we can change them around and, and, and form them into, so the, the graphical relationship is linear, and hence you get that simple algebraic expression. So if we have a hot spring water that contains 370 milligrams per kilogram of silica, what's the temperature and uh, what's the temp uh, what temperature is this concentration equilibrium of quartz? We simply project across to the curve and see that that's about 210, 220 degrees Celsius. That's how simple it is. This chemical geothermometer takes into account for steam loss. It uses the same theory, same uh, fluid mineral equilibria, so no different. But, and it's used mainly for hot springs or geothermal wells. But there's some other more sophisticated things. I mean, not too complicated, but there's some corrections that can be made to, to make this more useful. I should point out that both of the quartz silica geothermometers are good up to about 250 degrees. In other words, those simple formulas are actually only capturing this segment of the curve. And as Joe pointed out, when you go to hotter temperatures, uh, quartz solubility starts reaching a maximum. And that goes off this uh, expression here. Uh, and there's a longer polynomial expression that captures the full extent of, of the quartz silica solubility curve. Okay, some caveats, you can read those. We can spend two hours just talking about all those and, and looking at case studies. The sodium potassium geothermometer simply requires a sodium potassium ratio. This is based on potassium and sodium exchange with potassium and sodium feldspars. This has an experimental and theor theoretical underpinning. Sodium feldspar and potassium feldspar are common in many hydrothermally altered volcanic rocks. It could also be common in sedimentary units where in siliciclastic sed sediments. This is a very good geothermometer for getting deep hot temperatures because we see very little re-equilibration as waters rise to the surface. The effects of mixing and pollution are commonly very small, so it's, it can see through those sorts of effects, and also the boiling is, is, has, has no effect. So this is a very powerful uh, chemical geothermometer, and it usually gives you the hottest temperatures. You'll see some graphs that compare sodium potassium ratio with temperature with respect to the sodium and potassium feldspar equilibration curve, which is represented by that line. So these are well, these are waters from wells, and their respective reservoir temperatures down here. You see very good correlation between the sodium potassium ratios and the albite K feldspar phase boundary. And these are hot springs to show what these waters look like as they get to the surface. And so this tie line here just takes a, a 100 degree hot spring at Wairaki and compares it to a reservoir uh, water from a production well at Wairaki. Just point out that this sodium potassium ratio is now in a chemically favorable or conducive sort of set of units. These are molal units. And strictly, these concentrations are called activities, which is a thermodynamic concentration. And they require a bit more manipulation. So if you just take some milligram per kilogram concentration data and try and put it on this graph, you're going to be in trouble. The 
The other chemical geothermometer is potassium magnesium geothermometer. It's also pretty simple. It's got a more complicated formula. It actually captures many of the minerals that are in the propolytic alteration assemblage, which uh, Joe made reference to. This, on, based on experience, this chemical geothermometer tends to re-equilibrate faster than the sodium potassium geothermometer, hence it tends to give cooler temperatures. Some people will say, oh, uh, that may not be so useful, but if you actually think about it in a, in a positive framework, where the two geothermometers give similar equilibration temperatures, you want to have consistency from two different chemical systems in terms of interpreting a reservoir condition. That's good news. And the other thing is, is that those fluids must have risen pretty directly from the reservoir to the surface in order for them to be similar. Because the reason, because this difference, different rates of equilibration means that fluids that go along cooling, well, flow paths that have greater amounts of cooling, the differences between those two values will increase. So an, a fluid from an outflow zone will tend to have a cool potassium-magnesium equilibration temperature with respect to the potassium-sodium equilibration temperature. And yet fluids coming from a, to an upflow zone directly to the surface, these values will be the same. There's also aspects of, of mixing with shallow groundwater. Yeah? Uh, just a quick question on all these in general. Is uh, there any factors that have to be put in for standing supersaturation of some of these? In other words, uh, there's an equilibrium precipitation, but in a lot of natural waters, there will be some margin of supersaturation that is always present just because of the flux. Is that factored in, or is that not important? Okay, so I'll just go back to this again because what John asked was in all natural waters, we're always looking at in surface waters can be saturated, supersaturated, or undersaturated in different mineralogical constituents. They're controlled partly by this fluid mineral equilibrium, but they're also controlled by kinetic effects. And kinetic effects are enhanced at cooler temperatures. At hotter temperatures, reaction rates are generally fast. So we're taking advantage of that in the geothermal system. So the equilibration takes place here. The saturation takes place in this environment here. So the water that's rising, once that water escapes out into this open fracture, keep in mind that we're looking at a volume that's maybe one or two kilometers depth. So the poor water is sitting here hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of years, lots of time sitting there interacting with its mineralogical neighbors. Temperature, no temperature gradient here, so relatively constant, or, you know, it may be waxing and waning, but, uh, uh, you know, it's not a big uh, transient uh, of, uh, effect. When that water gets out into the open fracture, it's now rising to the surface rapidly. And when it gets to the surface, is it, sat is it saturated in quartz? Oh, you bet. It's supersaturated in quartz, way supersaturated in quartz. And that's what we're betting on, is for that to be working so that we can go back to the subsurface condition. If it was maintaining equilibrium all along that reaction path, we wouldn't have chemical geothermometers. So chemical geothermometers depend on that, the, the, the impediment of reaction kinetics as the liquids cool coming to the surface. Now, in a sedimentary basin environment, you know, we're not going to be dealing with hot springs so much, but we are going to have to worry about different time scales of fluid movement through a reservoir once we start inducing production. Sample, you've got two temperatures that aren't widely far apart, but they're, you know, thinking about the ternary Gutenbach diagram. 
what is the best way to try to interpret that? Is there any information to be gained by that? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, no, it's potent. Okay. The most important take-home point for everybody here, fluids have a history. The compositions can be used to interpret the history. If we have water samples that are spatially distributed, we put on our geoscience hat and we can do spatial analysis and those sorts of differences become very powerful. So I would I, I need to take some more time and sit down with you and show you how that diagram can be utilized a lot. Yeah. Okay, just in keeping with that, is there just an analytical equation to, to backtrack if you know if you know, for example, if you know how fast the water is moving. Yeah. Then is there an analytical expression to compute how how much we we rarely know how fast fast the water is moving. We know it, it has extremes. It uh, so varies that, too. What's that? It spatially varies too. That's right. So so you know whatever you know. So permeability has long log scale uh, variability in rocks. Well, mantle velocity is ranging over that same sort of uh, kind of numeric scale. And no, we so the, the short answer is no. We have we have no basis. For a point here is that when you're trying out chemical geothermometers, we use these in exploration and hope that our assumptions are true. As soon as we drill the first wells, the data that Joe Moore gives us helps us confirm that the minerals are present, we get a water sample, we've got a temperature profile, we've got to test and calibrate whether the chemical geothermometers are working. They always need to be calibrated. There are lots of site-specific variables that can affect how these work. Okay, I'm just going to, there's some gas tube thermometers too, just so you know. Uh, just a few slides on production chemistry. Sheet chemists help develop a natural state model. Of course, the miracle modelers are interested in the physical state. The chemists are, are also important because they help define not only the chemical structure, but how fluids are moving through uh, the reservoir and into the near surface environment. We use time series graphs mapping out enthalpy, changes in enthalpy, chloride, silica, CO2, other constituents over time. Also concerned about scaling and corrosion in the geothermal well, and as I mentioned, the environmental considerations. So chemistry reflects reservoir temperature, fluid compositions, permeability structure. The well field and layout design can be affected by what we learn about fluid compositions. It can affect the injection strategy. It helps to map out reservoir response to exploitation. A key thing is that we will see uh, breakthrough in the chemical composition of a, of a water faster than we'll see physical breakthrough or say a change in temperature. Now it may be a very short time gap between the two. So it might be just a few days, but it could be months. So in other words, if we're getting injectate coming through our reservoir, we'll be, we'll be able to see that if it's got a, if, if the chemical composition has, has changed, say due to flashing, which increases the chloride concentration, we'll be able to see that chemical breakthrough much earlier than we'll see any change in temperature because the injectate has a cooler temperature than the production fluid. So there'll still be heat sweeping out of the reservoir as it's moving towards the producing well. A key aspect is the use of heat mass balance expressions. Okay, so the chemistry is reflecting these two aspects. So there's just a, a, a hypothetical situation with injectors and producers. The red represents the producers, the blue represents the injector. Here are mass balance expressions, and a key point here is that 
in most geothermal systems, we assume or can show that chloride is a good tracer of heat. So if we know the flux of chloride and we can tag that chloride concentration to a deep geothermal water with a specific enthalpy, then by simply knowing the flux of, of chloride, we can calculate heat flow. <coughs> so that's another key point, is that the chemistry is reflecting that heat and mass transfer. We use things like enthalpy chloride plots in a simplistic way to trace out mixing and boiling trends. So enthalpy is shown over here on the left side, chloride on the uh, x-axis, this pathway shows what happens to a, a deep reservoir of water as it undergoes steam loss. So it's, the liquid is losing heat because it's separating the steam phase. But because steam is being lost, chloride is concentrating in the liquid phase, so the chloride concentration increases. And that's opposite to cooling due to, say, dilution or cold water mixing. So we can distinguish boiling from mixing flow paths. And you can do this on a field-wide basis. I don't have time to go through this, but this is an example in New Zealand, which allows you basically to see field-wide variations that you can directly re relate back to um, uh, these heat mass transfer and also the hydrology. Our gases also respond to this, so the gases are just as important. They're distributed between liquid and vapor as, as controlled by the gas distribution coefficient. And not shown in these diagrams, but the gas distribution coefficient is basically this C sub L and C sub V parameter combined, shown here. And these show the range as a function of temperature. Some gases are very soluble, some are insoluble. And you can trace these effects through different types of uh, diagrams by looking at relatively soluble gases and comparing them to, uh, well,